Welcome to Pediatric Podcast for PedsCases.com. Welcome to Myth and Facts about Sound Protection in Pediatric Population, a podcast made for PedsCases.com at the University of Alberta. I'm Dr. Harry Liu, a dermatology resident at the University of British Columbia. And I'm Jennifer Ling, a fourth year medical student at the University of British Columbia. This podcast will talk about different methods of sun protection in the pediatric population, and we hope to present evidence-based recommendations on sun protection that you can share with patients. We would like to thank Dr. Mary Weinstein and Dr. Connor Mulholland for developing this podcast with us. Dr. Weinstein is a pediatric dermatologist in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. Dr. Mulholland is a pediatric ophthalmologist at the BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. This podcast will be followed by another one that will discuss pigmented skin and eye lesions, as well as cutaneous and ocular melanoma in the pediatric population. Learning Objectives After listening to this podcast, we expect the learner to be able to 1. Describe the properties of UV light and its effects on the skin and eyes. 2. List different methods of sun protection. 3. Discuss how to effectively educate patients about sun protection. 4. Outline the initial steps in managing a sunburn. There was no financial support or any conflicts of interest for the development of this podcast. First, we'd like to present a case. It is your first day at an urban pediatric clinic as a third-year medical student. Your first patient, Lucy, is a 16-year-old girl who is in clinic with her mother for an annual checkup. Lucy is doing well medically. The mother expresses strong concern that her daughter has been tanning every day in her backyard without sunglasses and is even considering buying a tanning lamp online. She mentioned Lucy just had her daily tanning routine before coming to the clinic today. The mother never buys sunscreen because she heard that wearing sunscreens can cause vitamin D deficiency and the ingredients are harmful. The patient's past medical history and family history are unremarkable. She denies any history of severe sunburn. She does not drink alcohol or use recreational drugs. Her allergies include peanuts and pollen. On examination, you notice some blanchable mild erythema over her nose, cheeks, forehead, shoulders, and legs. There is no blisters and no tenderness upon palpation. It is clear that Lucy has mild sunburn, and how are you going to discuss with the patient and her mother about sun safety? Is the tanning lamp safe? Are the ingredients of sunscreen harmful for Lucy? Before answering all those questions, we will begin with some background information. Ultraviolet or UV light is a form of electromagnetic radiation that is often classified into UVA and UVB light. UVAs penetrate deeper into the skin and contribute to photoaging and cancer formation. UVBs affect the skin more superficially, causing sunburns and increasing the risk of melanoma. It is implicated in skin cancer formation. Protection from UV light is particularly important in childhood because currently, many individuals receive 40 to 60% of their total lifetime UV exposure before the age of 20. Protection from the harms of UV light remain the most important modifiable risk factor for skin cancer. The first step of sun protection is to understand the risk. It is important to tell caregivers to check the UV index, which is a scale ranging from 0 to 11 plus in Canada. The higher the UV index, the more UV light will reach the ground from the sun and ultimately present a higher risk of sunburn. UV index of 0 to 2 is low, 3 to 5 is moderate, 6 to 7 is high, 8 to 10 is very high, and 11 plus is extreme. It is important to educate patients and their caregivers about the risk and its implication. Studies have shown that for adolescent patients, the deteriorous effects of UV appearance, including pigmentation and wrinkles, motivate them more effectively than fear of developing cancer. The first step to consider for some protection is to seek shade. It is important to tell patients to minimize direct sun exposure from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. between April and September in Canada. 
because a UV index can be three or higher, which means moderate risk of sunburn. A quick way is to tell patients and their caregiver to see if their shadow is shorter than they are. If so, it is particularly important to stay in the shade. Besides seeking shades, the simplest way is to wear clothes that cover as much of the body as possible. When picking the clothes, go with the ones made with tightly woven fabrics and dark colors, but make sure they are loose and lightweight to avoid excessive heat. Some protective clothes with a UV protection factor ranging from 15 to 50 are also available. UPF is an indicator of how much UV radiation a fabric allows to reach one's skin. For example, clothing with a UPF of 15 protects the skin from all but a 1 15th of UV radiation. However, one study found that regular clothing may match or even exceed some protective clothing in blocking the transmission of UV radiation. Therefore, the caregivers may not need to buy special sun protective clothing. Wearing a hat with a brim of 7.5 cm or 3 inches wide provides additional protection for the head and neck. For infants, sun shades are available for strollers. Common window glass provides a variable degree of UV protection, but special window glass exists to provide both UVB and UVA protection. If the child spends a lot of time in the car, there are window films that can be applied to the side windows of the car for further protection. When protective methods mentioned above are not available, sunscreen can be used. It is one of the most common methods for sun protection. Sun protection factor SPF is the most important property of sunscreen, which is the number that tells you how long the sun's UVB rates will take to redden your skin if you apply the sunscreen exactly as directed compared with the amount of time without sunscreen. For example, if using a sunscreen with SPF of 30, it will take you 30 times longer to burn than if you use no sunscreen. Protecting against UVA is not currently labeled in Canada. Though in other countries, the PA system is used Sunscreen labeled as broad spectrum should offer protection from both UVA and UVB. Sunscreen is recommended for people with all skin colors because the darkest skin tones only have a natural SPF of approximately 13, which is not sufficient for sun protection. However, it is important to understand that there's a lack of evidence to support that sunscreen actually decreases the risk of melanoma in dark-skinned individuals. In terms of the sunscreen classification, it is a common mistake for people to classify sunscreen into chemical versus physical because both can absorb and block UV at the same time. It is more accurate to classify sunscreens into organic versus inorganic. In terms of formulation, creams are best for dry skin, gels good for hairy areas, and stick safe to use around the eyes. Spray formulas are popular among older children and teens, but it is challenging to know if a sufficient amount has been used to cover all sun-exposed areas. It can be a great option for reapplication and make sure to tell patient to spray an adequate amount and rub it in for even coverage. Never spray it around or near the face or mouth to avoid inhalation, and then the spray may aggravate asthma. Tinted sunscreen is relatively newer to the market, and it better fits the complexion of dark-skinned people, while partially blocking visible light as well as UV. Some sunscreen come in fun colors that children enjoy. There are many sunscreens on the market now, and it can be overwhelming to choose. It is important to educate patients and families about picking the right sunscreen. First, pick a water-resistant broad spectrum sunscreen with SPF of at least 30. Some people may think the higher the SPF is better. The truth is, how much water resistance 
and how it is applied are more important to the level of protection obtained. We will talk about picking between organic versus inorganic sunscreens later. One of the drawbacks of inorganic sunscreen is that it can be difficult to rub into the skin and patients would complain of white powdery residuals on their skin, even with micronized formulations. On the other hand, organic filters in the organic sunscreens can cause allergic or photoallergic reactions, but they are very uncommon with quoted prevalence of 0.8% from one Canadian study. The ingredients besides the sunscreen itself, including the fragrance, preservatives, and formaldehyde releasers, can also cause irritant or allergic contact dermatitis. So it is important to pick product with less of those ingredients to decrease the chance of irritant or allergic contact dermatitis. Interestingly, many sunscreens in the market that hold the labels sensitive skin or hypoallergenic actually contain allergenic and irritating UV filters, fragrances, and preservatives. This can be confusing for the patients, and one simple way is to pick sunscreen that is endorsed by the Canadian Dermatology Association. CDA Expert Advisory Board recognized a sunscreen product that are broad spectrum with the SPF 30 or higher, low potential for irritation, minimally perfumed or non-perfumed, and non-comedogenic. You can show the caregiver its logo so they can easily identify the product. At the end of the day, it is important to tell patients to use something they like the best themselves so they can use them more routinely. After picking a tolerable sunscreen with adequate protection, applying it properly is even more important. It is crucial to check expiry date on the sunscreen product before using them. The traditional recommendations for sunscreen application from doctors are to apply sunscreen 15 to 30 minutes before going outside. With the advancement in the technology of sunscreen production, most sunscreens now work immediately when they are applied to the skin. The current recommendation is to reapply every two hours. If sunscreen is applied sufficiently and correctly for the first time, there may be less of a need to reapply as frequently as we expect. However, one should be encouraged to reapply sunscreen after swimming or with heavy sweating. It's important to simplify the instruction so patients can actually remember and be compliant with the recommendations. According to the Skin Cancer Foundation, most people use less than half of recommended amount of sunscreen. For teenagers, you can educate about this teaspoon rule. It involves the application of one teaspoon of sunscreen to the face and neck area, one teaspoon to each upper extremity, a total of two spoons to the front and back torso, and two teaspoons to each lower extremity. Also, common areas to be missed include ears, neck, feet, hands, and even backs of the knees. Lastly, wearing lip balm with sunscreen SPF 30 is equally important. For children younger than 6 months old, sunscreen is not usually recommended. However, the Canadian Pediatric Society does suggest an inorganic sunscreen SPF 30 to be used when protective clothing or shades is not accessible. Caregivers may bring up the concerns of systemic absorption of chemicals in the sunscreen and all the potential side effects. There's a recent study in 2019 which showed that many of the organic sunscreen ingredients are absorbed into the bloodstream when applied topically. The implication of this study is unclear. The bottom line is that we cannot conclude that the sunscreen ingredients are dangerous. In addition, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's FDA updated regulatory requirements for sunscreen product and issued a proposed rule which asks many manufacturers to provide more data about the safety of several sunscreen ingredients. Two ingredients, 
titanium dioxide and zinc oxide were approved as generally recognized as safe and effective by FDA. Therefore, it seemed that winging organic sunscreen may be a preferred option at this time. Tanning lamps and beds can give off two to five times more UVA radiation than natural light, increasing the risk for malignant melanoma. CPS has consensus that people under the age of 18 years should be prohibited by law from using commercial indoor tanning facilities. It is important to tell the adolescents that a tan means the skin is sending out an SOS because they are being damaged by the UV light. For teenagers who still believe tanned skin are perceived as more attractive and favorable, there are sunless tanning topical product containing dihydroxyacetone available, which is essentially a harm reduction strategy. Sunscreen decreases the synthesis of vitamin D in the skin. But oral vitamin D supplement is a much safer, inexpensive, and well-tolerated way to achieve sufficient vitamin D without UV damage from the sun. For children one year of age or younger, 400 international unit of vitamin D or 200 international unit per kilogram per day for premature infants is recommended by Canadian Pediatric Society. Children younger than two years of age living above a northern latitude of 55 degrees, approximately latitude of Edmonton, those with dark skin, and those avoiding sunlight should be supplemented with 800 international units in the winter month from October to April. For children older than one year of age through adolescence, Health Canada recommends 400 international units of vitamin D daily. It is crucial to communicate with the caregivers that up to 80% of UV rays can go through the clouds and one can get sunburn on even cloudy days. Be aware of their surroundings as snow, water, concrete, and sand can reflect and increase the effect of UV radiation. Children may also use other topical products besides sunscreen. Many insect repellents have as their active chemical ingredient DEET, which can make sunscreen less effective. It is important to apply sunscreen about 20 minutes before insect repellent. Avoid products with a combination of repellent and sunscreen because sunscreen may need to be reapplied more often than repellent. Protection for the eyes is as important as that for the skin, but it is often neglected in pediatric populations. In fact, UV radiation can damage multiple parts of the eye, so it's important to choose sunglasses that help prevent the associated diseases. It's challenging to quantify sun exposure and the risk it contributes to each of these diseases. Nevertheless, these conditions often develop into adulthood, so early investment in sun protection is important for adult health. A number of conditions have been linked to ultraviolet radiation exposure, whether it is acute, such as in photokeratoconjunctivitis, or long-term consequences, such as cataracts, eye cancers, pterygiums, and macular degeneration. Sunglasses should provide broad-spectrum protection against both UVA and UVB rays. Cosmetic sunglasses block up to 60% of visible light and UVA, and 87-95% to of UVB rays. General purpose sunglasses block 60 to 92% of UV visible light and UVA and 95 to 99% of UVB rays. Special purpose sunglasses block 97% of visible light and 98.5% of UVA and 99% of UVB. While these are all suitable options, increasing ability to filter UV is often accompanied by increased ability to filter visible light so a balance between protection and visibility must be made. A number of factors determine the effectiveness of sunglasses, from the size, the closeness to the face, the orientation of the sun, the clouds, and any reflections from other surfaces. The face forward position is a particularly vulnerable position as the UV enters at the space between the sunglasses and the face. Sunscreen should be applied to the skin around the eyes as mentioned before. As children sweat, 
the sunglass screen may run into the eyes, causing stinging and irritation. This is not damaging to the eyes, but if it happens, the eyes should be thoroughly flushed with water. Different formulations, such as those for sports, may be less runny, but this will vary from person to person. In general, inorganic sunscreens cause less eye irritation. The signs of sunburn, including erythema, edema, burning sensation, or even blisters, usually appear 6 to 12 hours after sun exposure, and the patient can be more symptomatic by then. And the full effect may take 24 hours to appear. Ask the caregiver to seek medical attention if the sunburn happens in a baby less than one year old. Blisters with increased risk of infection, significant pain, or fever are the reasons for medical attention for older patients. Some basic strategies you can recommend to the caregivers for milder sunburn include For dehydration, give tribe water. Avoid further sun exposure. Use cool water compression or a cool bath to help skin feel better. Acetaminophen or ibuprofen for pain management. Let's go back to the case of our patient Lucy. To recap, she's a healthy 16-year-old female with a recent history of sun tanning who presents with diffuse, mild erythema over multiple body areas. For Lucy's mild sunburn, you should counsel Lucy and her mother on treating it with cool water and managing the burning pain with ibuprofen if needed. In terms of sun protection, you should emphasize the risk of melanoma and photoaging with any artificial UV source. For patients insist on having an tan appearance, sunless tanning possible products can provide that look without UV damage and would constitute a harm reduction strategy. Compliance with the recommendations is very important in teenage populations. Afterwards, you want to review both non-sunscreen and sunscreen methods for sun protection and discuss specific strategies that would work for Lucy. Lastly, Lucy should also take 400 IU vitamin daily as per Health Canada recommendation. It is also important to incorporate the discussion of sun safety as part of the regular checkup and ensure if Lucy is compliant with your recommendations. We hope you found our podcast helpful and learned something new. Here are some quick take-home messages for you. Number one, there are many other methods for sun protection besides sunscreen, including seeking shades, wearing protective clothes, and picking window glass with UV protection. Those should be recommended first to patients and their caregivers as a first-line approach to be supplemented with sunscreen to any remaining exposed skin. Number two, sunscreens generally have a good safety profile. Inorganic sunscreen like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide can be recommended to patients with concerns related to systemic absorption. Number three, it is crucial to educate adolescents' patients to avoid tanning beds and lamps since they significantly increase the risk of developing melanoma. This concludes our discussion for sun protection. We hope to discuss about pediatric pigmented skin and eye lesions, as well as cutaneous and ocular melanoma in our next podcast. Thank you for listening to Pete's Cases Podcasts. Check out www.peedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store. Share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.